Now, Rococo, which is the light, airy, uh, Baroque style of the 18th century, uh, has a, has a, well, it eventually gives way to neoclassicism. And uh, neoclassicism is a late 18th, early 19th century art movement. It's based on the revival of classical antiquity, uh, based on classical sculpture and architecture, and on high Renaissance painting. It is, of course, during the 18th century when they discovered um, a Pompeii and Herculaneum, uh, the cities on the, uh, on the, on, uh, in the, <laughs> the cities that were covered by volcanic ash of Mount Vesuvius. And one of the interesting things about that is that some of the paintings, of course, are very soft-edged, um, but people really didn't know that because unless you were you know, digging it up, uh, the, the images that would come back to Europe uh, would be line drawings. And so for a long time, uh, neoclassicism you know, felt that uh, classical art should be very, very hard-edged. However, there are some exceptions. Um, in which there's a, what I could say, a little softer version of neoclassicism, which we're going to see uh, with Angelica Kaufman. Angelica Kaufman is born in Switzerland. She's uh, raised in uh, Austria and Italy. Uh, she goes to England for about 16 years. Um, she returns uh, to Italy. Um, basically, um, she has a long and uh, a successful career as a history painter. And we're going to talk about what a history painter is uh, because it is very unusual at this time for a woman to be a history painter. Uh, she's, as we said, she's born in Switzerland. And she's raised in Austria. She seems to be a child prodigy as far as her artwork is concerned. Uh, because here we have a self-portrait of herself at age 13 um, and uh, already very accomplished. Maybe, uh, some of you may know that Albrecht Dewar has a silver point drawing of himself at age 13. Uh, there's a Bernini statue uh, that is uh, Bernini at age 13. Uh, so there's a certain number of artists who uh, really are uh, producing uh, work that one would expect from someone who was much older. Uh, she was trained by her father. Her father was an artist, uh, not nearly as successful as she will become, but he, that she was her first person that uh, trained her, Johann Josef Kaufmann. And she traveled with him in Austria and in Italy. And essentially that's how she gets her training. Um, she studies the art because they go to different museums and galleries and uh, meet people that have art collections. And she really has a continental uh, artistic experience. Um, she looks at ancient and Roman art. She meets the neoclassical artists in Rome. Uh, they live in Italy for a while. Uh, she later returns to Italy. Um, they live, in, they live in England. I should mention that one thing about her father uh, doesn't just train her and then you know, she goes off on her own. A woman couldn't do that. So her father travels with her and he essentially serves as chaperone, um, which is uh, you know, a way of ensuring um, that she, that, you know, to sort of prove her, her propriety, uh, which is one of the things that uh, you know, women artists and any woman who was in, um, like I say, the eye of the public uh, would, you know, would really have to emphasize. Uh, she's elected to the Academy of St. Luke in Rome. Uh, and then she goes to London, where she becomes a very close friend to Joshua Reynolds. And we see here with this uh, self-portrait uh, in which she's holding her drawing pad, uh, three-quarter view, uh, fairly loose uh, garments, which are probably fashionable, but they do remind you of classicizing garments, as we'll see. And here's another uh, picture of her. She is one of the founding members of the British Royal Academy. We're going to have to talk about that a little bit. And uh, she helps introduce neoclassicism to Britain. 
Uh, this was something that Joshua Reynolds was very, very um, instrumental in, in introducing neoclassicism to Britain. Um, I think it's Wendy Roweth, Roworth who wrote a book on Angela Kaufman and uh, she says that Kaufman actually had better training than Reynolds because she spent all that time you know, in Europe and um, that she was the embodiment it's been said that she's the embodiment of uh, neoclassicism in Britain, and she, she certainly does help introduce that. Uh, here we're seeing here a self-portrait with a bust of Minerva. And so that, in a sense, there's the correlation being made with the goddess of wisdom, uh, the goddess who presided over the arts and crafts, and who is a female, virginal, uh, classical deity. Uh, so she's taking on Minerva, as, as so many uh, learned women did, uh, taking on Minerva as a kind of um, an emblem, in a sense. Now, I wanted to mention a little bit about the British Royal Academy. Um, now, France had an academy, and uh, of course, uh, Rome had had one for a long time. Um, in, when the British Royal Academy was founded, there were 40... Um, original members, 40 founding members, uh, of which there were only two female members. And these two remain the only members of the Royal Academy in Britain until the 20th century. And I've read two dates for the, <laughs> the 20th century woman. One was like 1920 and another was 1936. So I'm not quite certain when they finally started letting women into the Royal Academy. Um, Angelica Kaufman was one, uh, was, who was uh, one of the original members. Um, Maria Mosher is, um, was uh, the wife of one of the members, and it, I, I'm not going to really talk much about her. Um, I think she does still lifes, and uh, she had a celebrated affair <laughs> with, the, uh, with an artist. Um, but at any rate, uh, those are the only two women who were allowed in the Royal Academy. They just would not elect any other women. Um, this is a picture, as you can see, uh, of the academicians of the Royal Academy. It was painted in 1771 and two. And it's showing the academicians in a room filled with uh, classical and Renaissance sculpture with a nude model, who you can see seated over on the right, your right, as you're looking at it. Um, but the women, where are they? Well, it wouldn't be proper for a woman artist to be in the same room with a nude model, and certainly even less proper uh, for be there with all the other men and a, nude mo and a nude figure. So the women are represented as pictures on the wall. So they are right up there on the, uh, as we face it, the left side Oh, excuse me, if you face the right side, uh, and you can see a portrait of Kaufman and Mosher. Uh, one of the things about this, of course, is it turns the women from being the creators of art and being active figures into objects of art, the static objects. Um, so they're included, but it's like, okay, they're women, they're subsidiary. Uh, this is Angelica Kaufman's portrait of her friend Joshua Reynolds. Uh, he was her friend. He was in, in uh, you could even call him her, her mentor in England. I mean, she was already an accomplished painter. Uh, Joshua Reynolds was particularly known for his portrait painting, and uh, he was very keen to introduce neoclassicism into England. Uh, he was the first president of the British Royal Academy, one of the founders. And uh, we're going to see how Kaufman represents him in his study uh, with the bust of Michelangelo behind him. We'll be talking about that. And I also brought up a picture of the still life to show you that uh, Kaufman does a beautiful job of that as well. Uh, so it's showing him uh, sort of like pausing uh, in the minute, uh, middle of his study. And there is the idea, of course, of the artist here as intellectual as well as the artist as a, you know, a skilled craftsperson. 
Uh, it's kind of interesting to look at the difference uh, how Joshua Reynolds portrays himself and how Kaufman portrays him. Uh, Reynolds has his hand on his hip uh, with this gesture of command that goes back to Holbein's pictures of Henry VIII. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what that's intended, but uh, certainly the, the gesture has been around for a while. Uh, and he, you know, he looks like a very commanding presence uh, with the bust of Michelangelo behind him. He's being, you know, liken, likening himself to the great Renaissance artist. Kaufman's picture is much more informal. I mean, this is this is a painting of a friend showing uh, her friend in as, as an intellectual at study, uh, and once again the bust of Michelangelo, which must have been a prized possession. Uh, the bust of Michelangelo is uh, in the shadows, in the background, but uh, making the likeness between the great Renaissance artist and uh, the great neoclassical artist. And as we said, uh, Kaufman chooses not the bust of Michelangelo for her self-portrait, but a bust of Minerva. Minerva, uh, or Athena, is the goddess of wisdom, Athena in Greek, uh, Minerva in Latin. And uh, so what essentially she's doing is showing herself as a woman of art and learning, uh, and uh, likening herself essentially uh, to the, uh, uh, the the classical deity who is the patron of art and learning, uh, rather than using the bust of a male artist, uh, where the connection certainly wouldn't be as clear. Now, her personal life um, was not always wonderful. Uh, while she was in England, she met this uh, supposedly Swedish count, and uh, he was in all the fashionable circuits. He fooled everybody. He didn't just fool her. It turned out he was a con man. Uh, he was not a count, uh, and uh, she found out too late. She had married him. And they had the marriage annulled. Essentially, she gave him money to go away. Uh, he, you know, was, was a dishonest person. Uh, she was, he was not what he seemed to be. Uh, and there is even the possibility that he may have uh, fraudulently married women for their money previously. Uh, I think it speaks to Kaufman's probity, uh, to her virtue, if you will, uh, to her moral probity, that she does not marry again until after her husband, <laughs> can we call him her former husband, uh, has died before she's willing to marry again. And she is Catholic. Um, she's, it's like she's not going to take any chances again. Uh, probably, as I said, the marriage was annulled. It was not a divorce. Uh, it was a marriage under false pretenses. And the man may not have even been free to marry. So by all you know, legal and moral um, criteria, you know, she could have married again. Uh, because it wasn't a valid marriage. But she chooses not to marry until after um, the person that she gave vows to, whether under false, you know, and she was being tricked uh, or not. Um, so in uh, 1781, she marries a Venetian painter, Antonio Zucchi, who becomes her business manager. Uh, and she continues, of course, to be uh, the a famous artist. Uh, she returns to Venice. She returns, goes, then she goes to Rome. Um, she returns to Venice. I think her father dies then. And then uh, they go to Rome. And she has this wonderful um, reputation as a renowned artist. Uh, she earns a lot of money. She's very, very wealthy. And uh, she knows the people in the artistic circles. There's uh, Goethe, for example. Um, has, says that he dined with Angelica Kaufman in Rome every Sunday, and they looked. He went and looked at Renaissance paintings with her, and he says she has a trained eye and knows a great deal about the technical side of painting. Moreover, she is sensitive to all that is true and beautiful, and incredibly modest. Um, he says that for a woman, she has extraordinary talent. 
And you will be hearing throughout history <laughs> uh, these backhanded compliments or left-handed compliments, however you want to refer to them. They were intended to be very complimentary to the women artists. Uh, but they were saying, wow, it's, it's incredible. She's a woman and she can actually do something. Um, the other leitmotif that you'll hear uh, is uh, the comparison of a woman to a man. Is you, you, you couldn't believe that it's, a, it's a, a woman painting rather than a man. And that's, once again, it's supposed to be a compliment. Uh, but the assumption is that somehow this is uh, a aberration, that women just you know, can't be as, as good as men. So uh, if she's successful, uh, she's, she's unique. We see a lot of unique women throughout history. Um, and I wanted to show you this self-portrait uh, between music and painting. Now, it's a kind of allegorical self-portrait. Uh, and I must admit, uh, if you think about the date, she's born in 1741. So she must be about 50 when this is being painted in 1791. But she still, she shows, she shows herself as a young, beautiful woman. Obviously, she was a young, beautiful. Uh, she's supposed to have been very vivacious. Um, and she's supposed to have made friends very, very easily. Uh, so she's supposed to be this young, vivacious woman. And of course, in a sense, it does make some sense because what we're seeing is a painting of an initial choice that she had to make in her career. So even if she's painting it when she's 50, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the choice of her life, as it were. Um, she evidently was quite accomplished in music, as, as uh, many women were, or were expected to be, as well as in painting. And she's choosing a career. Uh, which was not something that most women had a choice in. Um, but uh, she's, you know, obviously her father encouraged her, uh, and uh, that makes all the difference. So she's being torn between the allegorical figure of music and the red dress with the uh, musical uh, uh, score written in her lap. Uh, and painting, and painting, of course, is a woman in blue and gold and holding a palette while she's pointing upward. It looks like she's pointing up to the top of a mountain. Now, this is a, um, as I say, it's an allegory of choice, uh, of her having to decide which way her career will go. The source of this type of of a picture where you're choosing between two personifications uh, goes back to a classical theme, uh, Hercules at the Crossroads, in which Hercules uh, has to decide between virtue and vice, uh, between a life of honor and hardship or a life of luxury and pleasure. And one of the most uh, famous paintings, I guess, of this is the uh, painting of uh, Anibala Karachi. Uh, Baroque painting somewhere around 1600. Uh, Hercules at the crossroads, and as you can see, uh, virtue uh, is pointing upwards uh, to the high and rocky road of virtue, uh, scale the heights, as it were. And uh, Hercules is sort of sitting between them. He's not really giving an indication which way he's going, actually. Uh, pleasure or vice or voluptas is, uh, is uh, shown as a uh, uh, somewhat nude woman, uh, nude with a transparent drapery, uh, and beside her there are uh, there are attributes, little objects that suggest there's a, a mask, which could be uh, we could think of a theater mask, but it could also be a mass of deceit. Uh, so there's uh, little uh, attributes there that suggesting that her way may be uh, pleasurable and easy, but it's not the right way to go. So here we see Kaufman and. Uh, Karachi's uh, version of this uh, choice between two uh, personifications. You'll notice that Kaufman uh, has shown painting as pointing upward. Well, is that the high and rocky road? Uh, the virtue sometimes is very, very, very difficult. Uh, well, it would be for her to achieve things, but essentially, painter is saying you know that you will achieve the pinnacle of fame. And it may be a difficult upward struggle, but you, know, like, you can do it. Of course, by this time, she's already done it. Uh, so she knows which, which way is going to work out. 
Um, Kaufman turns almost regretfully to music. Uh, she's you know, sort of squeezing her hand, but she's gesturing and uh, turning in the way that she's going to go, the way of painting. Now, you'll notice we've talked about some mythological themes. Uh, we've talked about allegories. And that's what history painting is. I said that she's a female his history painter, which is very unusual. Uh, history painting could be history. It could be mythology. It could be allegorical. It could be religious subjects. Um, and these were considered in the 18th and uh, part of the 19th century to be the most important subjects for art. They were considered to be lofty. They were considered that they would have uh, some kind of moral lesson. Uh, they would be uplifting to the viewer. Uh, the themes were usually narrative. I mean, you could have something like a Madonna and Child, which is uh, not necessarily a narrative, although we know the stories behind it. Um, but they were supposed to you know, make you better, essentially. Uh, all history paintings have uh, as their main uh, forms uh, the human figure, because who is doing this history, uh, but the human beings. Now, generally women artists were not supposed to be history painters. Uh, one of the main things that history painters had to do was paint nude or nearly nude classical figures. You know, if you're showing the Greek gods, you know, you can't have them dressed from ankle to neck. <laughs> um, and to be a great history painting, you had to know anatomy. Now, women were forbidden to study the nude. And you'll think back to uh, your uh, Linda Nochlin's article about why were there no great women artists. Well, maybe there were some, but it was very difficult because for centuries, really from the, uh, certainly from the 16th century, uh, for the 15th century, actually, uh, through the 19th century, uh, our painters were judged on how well they knew anatomy, how well they could paint anatomy and study the nude. And women were forbidden to study the nude. In fact, women were no, were, women, that prohibition stayed until artists were no longer judged by how well they did the nude. So in the 20th century, when abstraction comes in, well, it seems like it's now all right to let them study the nude, at least in certain cases. Um, so how did she manage? We see this little uh, engraving here, little print, um, of her studying and drawing a torso. She learned anatomy from classical statues Renaissance paintings, and uh, draped models. And of course, always very carefully covered in the strategic places. And you'll find that that is also true um, of her classical forms. Um, there's really no genitalia showing, which would be totally uh, horrifying uh, if a woman artist were to, to do that. So uh, all of her figures are strategically draped, as we might say. Now, one thing that most artists did uh, to both prove their skill and to train themselves, and also because they would get commissions for copies, uh, was to copy other artists. So here we see a copy uh, of Angelica Kaufman, the larger image, uh, after the Cumian Sibyl of Domenichino, who is a uh, 17th century uh, Baroque artist, one of the classical Baroque artists of uh, Italy. Uh, it's in the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and I will tell you that my picture is a bit dark, uh, because of course I'm taking it with film, and, uh, but uh, there's some details. And uh, we often see in her work classical female themes, not exclusively, certainly, uh, many, many male themes as well. Uh, one of the interesting things that this is a familiar subject, but some of the subjects she uses are not always the most famous uh, subjects. So she obviously had a good classical education. Um, this one is Penelope, uh, Penelope at her loom. Uh, and Penelope, of course, is the wife of Odysseus or Ulysses, uh, who had went off to fight the Trojan War and took 20 years to come home. Uh, during that period, she was much besieged, besieged is probably a good word, um, beset, besieged, <laughs> betwixt between suitors who wanted to marry her 
and she wanted to remain faithful to her husband, whose fate she did not know. Now, um, she made a bargain with the suitors that she was weaving a tapestry, she's, and when she'd finished weaving this, then she would make her decision of who she would, make, uh, who she would marry. And so every day she wove and wove and wove, and every night she tore out whatever she had woven, whatever she had done that day, so that she never had to make the decision. Um, she is the epitome of the faithful wife, and you can see at her feet the bow and the dog of, Uly of Ulysses or Odysseus. Um, they both feature very strongly in, in the story because when Odysseus does return and uh, nobody recognizes him, he's been gone for 20 years, except his very, very old dog who knew him when he was a puppy. And the dog greets him. And Odysseus, who's you know, trying to come in out incognito, it's, it's horrible. He, he has to ignore the dog and the dog dies. And you know there is that that element of the faithful wife, the faithful dog, and it is it is um, you know it just it just seems so tragic you know that the, the dog who has stayed alive to recognize his master doesn't even get the, the acknowledgement. Um, the other attribute, the bow of of uh, Odysseus, uh, Odysseus would be so strong that he could pull this uh, shoot an arrow with this bow that nobody else could pull, and uh, so. Um, he slays all the suitors with his bow. Um, so this is a classical female, uh, classical female um, of great uh, fidelity and propriety. There's a, you know, a moral lesson therein of what a woman should be. 